Amen. So in this conversation of walking in love, last week we started the conversation on the dimensions of God's love. And we talked extensively about Ephesians 3, how Paul prayed, why Paul prayed, and what was the object of the prayer, what was the end of the prayer, what did he want to achieve uh, in their lives, and we realized that he wanted them to be full. And that when we are full of God, love is natural. That God's love is like in love and in all things, we are like gloves. And it's only when God takes possession of us that we are able to love the way he wants us to love. And we said it is only when we come to the di- understanding of those dimensions of God's love that we can be filled with the fullness of God and then spill over into loving others. And that this love is not something that is derived by knowledge. The Bible says it passes knowledge. It passes understanding. It's, it's more experiential. It's also four-dimensional is, is rich. It's not just linear. It's not linearly truth. It has other dimensions that passes what you can just know. And we said that if you look at the pathway to God's fullness, it says inner strength, rooted and grounded in love, and then when we understand and comprehend the dimension of Christ's love, uh, we'll be find ourselves filled. Now, we share that in this verse of scripture, this very popular John 3, 16, we can see key elements that show us a little bit of the dimension of that love. Now, that four dimensions of love wasn't defined. Yeah? And somebody says, when God's word is not absolutely definitive about something, it leaves room for multiple dimensions of answers as well as we seek God to understand how do I understand this love and how does this love operate. And today, I want to just look at a few very interesting stories and a way of looking at these stories and looking at life in a way that makes us love the way that God wants us to love. Now, this is how God loved us. We know that his first love, he so loved the world, is not specific to anybody. It's a love that God has for all the world. God loves everyone. It's universal. But guess what? The price he paid is also his deepest price. And you can know how much depth a love has or something has by how much it costs. So if Johnny came to meet me now and Johnny said, I need 50K. And I say, my brother, I don't have. But this is my phone. It's what I use to do my business. I will sell it and give you. That means <laughs> the depth of that love is the price I'm willing to pay. It's a big price. I was reading a story, a very interesting story of a soldier, a man who was training some soldiers, and it was a very strict training. It was a very strict, extreme soldier training. He had 20 people he was training, and he told them, if you make a mistake, I will kill you. I'll kill you myself. I won't wait for the war to kill you, because you're likely going to die in war. So if you make mistakes here, it's death. And... I don't know why they were so harsh. Maybe it was maybe it was from another country. I don't know. But he took them apart and he told them, you go in the morning, these are your tools. You walk with the tools and in the evening you come back and submit your tools and give an account of the day. On day one, the day the lecturer usually wants to use to show that he's serious, they brought the equipment back and they counted the equipment and there were 19. Uh-uh. He says, as if people are playing with me. Who? Did not bring his own back. Everybody kept quiet. He said, okay, I'm going to shoot five of you so that you know I'm serious. I'll kill five now. And I'll keep, keep on killing five until one of you shows and says he's the one that brought the equipment. And everybody was dumbfounded. And he counted ten seconds. And on the ninth second, a young man stepped out. And the guy didn't waste time. Immediately, wow, shot him. So let them know that it's not play. Don't bring your tools. You get shot. And then he shot him. His colleagues decided to count the equipment again. And it was 20. The man made a mistake in his counting. So the guy, what happened? The guy felt, why would I allow them to kill five? Let me allow him to kill one. 
and save the lives of the others since nobody's holding up that they didn't bring their equipment. In those 10 seconds, the man analyzed his future, analyzed his future wife, his future children, his future possibilities, and decided that, you know what? There are 20 other lives here. Let me give mine up. Now, and it's a metaphor to understand the degree of what Jesus Christ did for us is even deeper than that. So he gave his only begotten son. And then the love becomes specific at the point where whosoever, whosoever believes. So by believing, we move ourselves away from this love that was general, this love that pursued us in paying the sacrifice. It becomes a love that is relational with those that believe. And in that relationship, we have access to everlasting life. And somehow, the very nature of everlasting life compels you to want others to be beneficiaries of the same. The Bible says we have received from him the gift of salvation and a compelling task of sharing it with others as well. So, we said that this love has, we can look at it on a level and see these four dimensions of being universal, a love that pursues us, a love that becomes relational, and then a love that becomes missional. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are filled with God's love, you will want to find outlets. Amen. If we are full of God's love, if we really understand and comprehend and appreciate God's love, we will be looking for outlets. It's like when people have money. Why is it that evil people, good people, bad people, when they have money, they want to do charity? When money is too much, you must spend it. You'll be looking for causes. Who can I bless? Where can I make a difference? This money, is it just going to be my account? Am I going to die with this money in my account? You know, people will, if you are full of something, there will naturally be a way for you to have expression. Why are they buying expensive things? Because people that are selling expensive things also need money. So this morning, I want us to just quickly look at these dimensions. And I saw a very interesting analogy about these dimensions and key thoughts about what makes up this love. And I'd like us to look at them very, very quickly. One is grace. Somebody says grace is like length. Grace is, what's grace? Grace is God's gift and favor that we don't merit. Amen. Is there anything in your former life that qualified you for salvation? Is there any reason why God will save you? There's no reason. And that grace of God is extended to all, to all equally. God is willing to accept everybody. The Bible says he wants that all men be saved. This is what he desires, that all men will be saved. So we see that God's grace extends to everyone. He said, you have heard before now, love those who love you, hate those who hate you. I'm saying no. Jesus' command is love everyone. Your love is, uh, is grace. God's love was to everyone. And he's our example. Amen. I like Ephesians 5 that uh, PK took us through. He said, most of what God does is love you. Stay close to him and learn how to love. So we have his grace. We don't only have his grace, we have his mercy. His mercy, mercy and grace are like two sides of the same coin. Grace is what you don't deserve, you get. Mercy is what you deserve, you don't get. We deserve judgment. We deserve punishment. We deserve to be in a burning hell. We deserve everywhere that anybody who rejects God should be kept in. But his mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. So in we, we have his mercy from everlasting to everlasting. He forgives us without limit. Have you ever wondered? You know, we have these arguments about uh, some people, they believe that once you are saved, you are saved forever and those kind of things. After you are saved, have you done something wrong? Did God have mercy on you? How does that work? How does that work? You know, how does it work? That you're able to go back to God and he'll still be able to have mercy on you. And what audacity will we have if we also refuse to have mercy on others? For depth, we know that that love also has judgment. The Bible says God's judgments are deep. Bible says his 
judgment is on the, the concept of judgment is unsearchable. God, even though He has grace and mercy, is also just. And it's just this judgment has a dimension to love that has discipline. That doesn't just say I love you so you can be careless with your life. Are we together? You love your children, but you correct them. You love your children, but you give them that. God's love is not without an eye as well. And then we have the height dimension of his love, which is truth. The Bible says his ways and his thoughts are higher than our ways as the heavens are above the earth. It means his ways, his thoughts are high, whereas are not as high. So for height, we have his truth. The Bible says Jesus Christ came as for grace and truth. His knowledge is high and unattainable that he also communicates in this love the truth to us. And I'd like us to examine this in a few interesting ways. So Luke 15, which I may not read today, I'll just gloss over so that we can do this in good time. It talks about the parable of the prodigal son. And I'd like us to just quickly look at that parable. And what I would like to leave us with today is like a handle for looking at all the parables, for looking at all the stories, for looking at everything that Jesus does. If you get this tool correctly, and you're able to use this well, it will help us navigate and love appropriately as we should. In this story of the lost prodigal son, there were other three other parables in this chapter. There was the lost coin, there was the lost sheep, the lost coin, and then the lost son. And in this story, it's a popular story. It's a story that has even made its way into mainstream education. It's not just a scriptural story anymore. It's now a story that people analyze for different things. In this very simple story, a man had two sons. One son woke up one morning and said, Daddy, give me what you will give me when you die. It's as if you don't want to die. And me, I want to live it up. I want to enjoy my life. If you, God forbid, that you live to be 105. And I'm 70. And you die. It makes sense. Does it not make sense? It makes sense. Eh? Queen Elizabeth. Yes. Yeah. I was going to say that you don't want to be like the queen. Your prayers are living long. So, they now say you have inherited 100 million. What do I go to? 65, 70. Felix. You just be thinking that. So, this is what I waited for. Even your, even your own children are too old by that time. You understand? You know, like we have 100 million. What do you want to do with it? To so this guy, Soji, Ellie. I said, oh, come, daddy. We love you. But uh, life is now. Give me. Don't give me. What you wanted to give me? Give me. And he took it and entered town. Now, the Bible describes some of the things that he does. The Bible says prostitutes, parties, drinking, making new friends, hanging out, you know, Dorime, <laughs> Kubana, <laughs> living it up. And unfortunately for him, it wasn't planned. The boo season became a beer season. And somehow, the monies he put in different places to secure himself and all that, and then he learned the age-long adage that a fool and his money are soon parted. And he realized that mystery or poverty doesn't have friends. That people like to lick the hand that has palm oil, not the one that is bleeding. So his friends abandoned him. His money abandoned him first. His friends followed. And then he began to look for a job. And he couldn't even find a befitting job. And he began to get hungry. And in the hunger, he attempted to eat even the slop that they were giving to pigs. And then one morning, this guy also woke up again. And realized, ah, my father has lives. They are not suffering like this. <laughs> even if I'm suffering, can I be my father's slave? I will go back and beg my father. And tell him, look. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't even want to be your son. Just take me as one of the hirelands. Allow me to be walking here. 
I see the way our servants behave. They eat well. And the Bible says as he was going to his father's house, his father saw him from a distance and ran towards him. His father didn't allow him to make the speech. He said, come, 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 come. Forget that. Come. I have been waiting for you. Amen. Now, what do we see in this story? And I'd like us to look at these stories. And every story, I will share. I have a few stories lined up. But I'm going to share all the stories. I'll share just a few. And then I'll give you the handle of how you can look at them. Now, every story we look at this like this in scripture is a picture. It's giving us a picture. And there are two tools we can use to look at the story. We can look at the story with a mirror. And after we look at the story with a mirror, we can look at it with a window. The mirror helps us to see ourselves in the story. And the window allows us to look at life the way Jesus would like us to look at life. So let's look at this story and let's look at the picture painted here. Who is the father? God. Who is the first son? Hmm? In this story, the Jews. Or anybody who feels he has a right to God. Anybody who feels he's righteous. Anybody who feels he's in right standing with the father. Anybody who feels he's, he's, he's saved. The elder brother can also be you. Amen. Good. In fact, today, the elder brother is you. Before today, the younger brother was you. And who's the younger brother? The younger brother, according to this story, God says, all of humanity are my children. Even those living it up. Hello? The fact that the guy is momentarily dorime, momentarily having a good time and catching cruise. Sorry, catching cruises. Does not exempt him from my love. And ladies and gentlemen, there is nobody more angered by God's love this way than people who are already inside. There's a message I will preach today. And some people here will call me and say, ah, Pastor, is it correct like that? Is it you, it's because you want to talk to people that are not saved, that you are speaking, preaching that kind of message? Because I listened to that message. I didn't see, you know, it wasn't full of stuff. People are inside are looking for stuff. People on the outside are looking for fish. I understand it very correctly. God is saying, everyone is my child. The reason why they are living the way they are living is because they refused my love. They rejected, they took advantage of me. So you see people who don't know God, but they are living it up. Oh, they are enjoying a good life. You are wondering how God, I'm praying, I'm attending choir hazards. I'm leading worship. And this guy who is, he doesn't even have sense like me. Not, he gives us, it's not as if he has like me. Oh, he's having a better life. He has connections. He's making money. He doesn't even know what he's making money from. God. God when? God how? He's saying they're my children and God's love extends. His grace extends to all and is far reaching and can reach to all. And when they come back or do as if they want to come back, I am willing to accept them. Sometimes psychologists and people who analyze will say, no, they are taking advantage of you. They are trying to, no, no, yeah, hey, hey, father, what's going on here? Father is saying, no. If I will be mumu for anything, I'm mumu for everybody to be saved. It gives us a picture of God's grace. And in that mirror, we see that people on the outside, what the father wants the elder brother to be doing, is the elder brother is the one that's supposed to be making calls and saying, oh boy, where are you day? That is missing you. Not the one who sucks. I feel, I was sharing an example sometime. I said, a day is coming when PK will stand. And that guy that PK knows is a chronic unbeliever will get saved on his deathbed. And then he will stand before God. And God will say, equal reward. No, God will not even say equal reward. God will give that guy reward first. And then Kole will say, ah. If the people that are last minute are getting this kind of reward, oh, I'll pay you, I have made it. <laughs> Wait, Inka. Inka. He's getting this one. Ha, let me wait for my turn. 
And then he will get his turn, and God will say, as I need to yinka, I don't say, ah, God, I served you as a teenager. <laughs> when my paddies were testing cigar, I was testing officials. <laughs> when, when they were at the joints, I was in fellowship. <laughs> when they were doing babes, I was faithful. But God is saying, look, my grace extends to all, and if you see it correctly that all that is mine is yours, you should be on my side seeking to seek them out. I like what the father said to the son. He said, ah, my son, I killed fat calf for him. Everything in this house us. He has collected his own. Everything left is yours. Allow us to celebrate your brother. Because that's what we are about. This love is, this grace does not look at face. Does not look at heart. He gives gifts to people that they don't deserve. Every one of us who made it in didn't deserve it. Amen. That's the mirror. Now what's the window? The window is realizing I'm supposed to extend this love to others as well. Not just to my brothers and sisters. In the faith. Because there's a selfishness in that. But to everybody who is on the outside as well. And ladies and gentlemen, this love is not one-dimensional. It's multidimensional. It means... It is not just tell them about the gospel. That's not the only love that you can show. Because it's beyond knowledge. Your own responsibility may be to represent Christ to them in a way that makes the person who shares the gospel have an easy click. I was together. I have a brother who called me recently and he was me recently and said, ah, nah, you have lyrics, so yeah, should we do a song together? I met him in university days. I never preached to him. I never preached. To him. But we're living in the same room. And for me, it was a, I can't forget him. I can't forget his story. One day he came to me. I said, sir, I've watched you for the last seven months. I was in 200 level, he was in 100 level. You know this age difference looks like it's much when you're young. <laughs> the younger you are, the more the age difference. As you're going older, you're like, ah, party me. As in, we're, we're colleagues. <laughs> so he came to meet me and said, I've been watching you. Can I follow you to where you are worshiping? I, I don't. I think he was going to Catholic church or something. He wasn't too regular. He just felt there's something about you. There's how you speak. There's what you do. There's how you live. There's how you behave yourself in this room. I just want to follow you. Can I follow you? And that's how he followed me to fellowship. I never invited him. Maybe they preached a message there eventually that got him saved. My own was to bring him to the journey by the way I lived before him. God's grace is far reaching to all and that is a dimension of his love that you and I need to mirror, not only see ourselves and we need to be on God's side in reaching out to others without discriminating. Without saying, ah, this one is too bad. There's no way that it's too bad. In fact, the bad that they are, the more the work they have to do. Amen. Because if God can rescue you from a far place, then he can use you to rescue people from a far place. If God rescue you from a near place, then it will be difficult for you to go to the far place. Amen. So the prodigal son tells us about this grace that is far-reaching. He's able to hold back on the one he has and look for the one that is lost. His father, the father's heart was already outside searching. So when he saw, ah, that means... Every day, the man is standing by his window and looking out and saying, where's my son? May God grant us the grace to love others that way in Jesus' name. Amen. Number two, we have mercy. Second dimension. And if you want to look at Jesus correctly, you see in Jesus, because the Bible says, how do we love? By following Jesus. By looking at how Jesus did it. Jesus is a mixture of Miracles, parables, what else? And the life he lived. You can summarize Jesus in his miracles, his parables and life. That means every miracle, every parable, and every action that Jesus Christ took is very indicative of his nature, his character, his values, and what you and I need to emulate. In this story, I like this story, and I think we talked about it a little bit last week. This story talks about a man who owed money. He owed 
thousand talents. Hello? Ten thousand talents. And he went to meet the man that he owed. The king, he owed the, the master. And he went to meet the master that he owed. I said, please, have mercy on me. I will pay back. Do you know how much 10,000 talents is? Do you know how much it is? I did an analysis of 10,000 talents. <laughs> I did an analysis of 10,000 talents. And 10,000 talents is the amount of salary you'll be paid if you work for 200,000 years. Eh? So, 10,000 talents is 200,000 years of labor. It is 60,000, 60 million working days. In modern money, it is $3.48 billion. Hello? When is somebody has Jack BC? Hello? 200,000 years. Even buying him is a favor. The Bible says, the man took him and his family. I actually took him. Say, don't worry. You, your servants, your children, everybody will be my servants, my slaves. I feel that was a favor. What the guy said, you know what the guy said? He said, please, have mercy on me. I will pay all. Now, what was bothering this guy? Why, why do, do you have this kind of 200,000 years? He's trying to let you know that our debt is eternal. 200,000 years is just a frame of time that helps you capture the eternity of it. You know, sometimes I'll say a thousand years. They're using 200,000 years to, to measure eternity. He says that the debt we owed is eternal. It cannot be paid. But the master decided to forgive and did not give him what he deserved. It's a show of mercy. And that show of mercy, what should mercy make you and I do? Mercy should make you and I also very interested in being merciful to others. In fact, God did a comma on it and said, if you don't show others mercy, you will not benefit from the mercy I've already shown you. Hello? It means God is saying, I have a river bank of eternal mercy for you, but it's contingent upon you. Transferring that mercy to others. In this parable, this second man goes and finds the person that is owing him 100 denarii and drags the guy to jail and say the guy must pay and starts pressurizing the guy until God heard and said ah, 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 ah. no, 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 no. Miro are you and I showing mercy to others? Or are we too preoccupied? Because that's what happened here. Are we too preoccupied with our own getting that we miss out on God's giving? Do we pay attention to people around us and realize that even though what you are owing is 200 million, 200,000 years worth of debt, that somebody around you may just need a meal. Somebody around you may just need what will not be sufficient for you for a day? And are we showing that mercy because it's the dimension of God's love? And if we will ever be able to give it, it must, first of all, because we understand what we have received. I remember this song. It says, The kind of debt I deserve. The kind of punishment that was reserved for me. All of it was taken away on the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for suffering on my behalf. Ladies and gentlemen, the lens with this is you and I need to look at, and listen, the origin of our love is God's love for us. I always say this. My wife, the origin of my love for my wife is Jesus' love to me. Whenever my wife, whenever my wife upsets me, and it's not just wife alone, it must transfer to everybody else as well. Whenever my wife upsets me, and it happens, we don't look like we upset each other. It happens. When she upsets me, and I'm boiling internally, eh? I'm boiling. I, I go to God. 
and I say, God, God opens my eyes and says, this thing you're angry about, are you doing it to me? Ah, I say, I'm doing it to you much more. He says, so, am I angry at you? Huh? It's God. <laughs> oh, amazing. He is God. But he says, be imitators of God. Like children. You are clear his likeness. Good. So he's saying, if you can see me do it, I want you to step in and do it. You can't do it, but I'm God. I want to feel you to do it. Are we together? Oh, there have been days in my life where as a result of my of my of my anger, I feel like, oh boys, I can only be angry if I've not talked to God. Though. I can only be angry if I've not analyzed how he compares to Jesus. The moment I take that lens and I wear it, I realize I have taken much worse times one million from you. Take it! And it extends beyond your wife. It extends to other people as well. So, it says, don't, don't act impulsively. When you are considering your actions, take your mirror, look at what Jesus did, look at yourself, then take the lens and say, how will I behave based on what I've come to realize? Mercy, grace, are what you call the horizontal dimensions of God's love. The vertical dimensions are height and depth. But the horizontal, horizontal is what attracts people to Jesus. Amen. The horizontal is what attracts people to Jesus. The horizontal is grace and mercy that makes people attracted to you. That makes people attracted to Jesus. The fact that I don't need to qualify for the love. The fact that I don't get what I deserve. Some people, the way they have done you, what they deserve. What they deserve. They are. And I will show you. I will show you. And then you ask yourself, has God shown me? If God shows me, can I stand? Or can I just chalk it up into a... It's for my character development. Because sometimes that's what it is. God is... God needs different kinds of tools to shape you into who he wants you to be. And then very quickly, in summary, we have judgment. And we have truth. Now, I won't share this in detail because you have the tools, you can look at it yourself. But I like, allow me to share this judgment because it's, a, it's something that we are tearing apart with the philosophy that the world operates with today. You know, the world operates on very funny philosophies today. They operate philosophies of uh, in different directions that makes you wonder have we, have we lost track or lost bearing? And one of those places is judgment. People say, don't be harsh on the children. Don't be, don't spank them. Speak words. Or do the different philosophies. I don't want to go there today. But something happened with the fig tree. That fig tree, I don't know if you have, if you have Imagine the video of that fig tree that Jesus caused. There was something shocking about it. Jesus Christ saw that he had leaves and was walking towards it with anticipation that he would find figs there. And then he got there, he didn't find figs. The disciples were there behind him. And he cursed the fig tree. And right before their eyes, the leaves shriveled. And the tree shriveled. And it was like, ah! They called each other and said, did we just see what we saw? So, 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 did you see what I saw? See, I saw it. See, he, he. see what Jesus Christ did. And Jesus Christ smiled and said, This is how it works in the kingdom. Oh. This kingdom I belong to. This is how it works. If you have faith and don't doubt, see that mountain? You can tell it to skip into the river. There is nothing that you will not be able to do if you hold on to God, believe, and don't doubt. But what was the element of what happened here? What happened here was every miracle that Jesus Christ did was 
development, was healing, was curing, was helping. This one wasn't curing. This was the first miracle that required destroying. And why did Jesus Christ destroy? Because Jesus Christ, if you look at his woes, his shouts, every time Jesus Christ spoke a word that you feel was in anger, it was about one issue. Hypocrisy. Appearing to be different from what you really are. He told the Pharisees, he said, if you acknowledge that you are blind, you will have been without fault. But now that you say you see, ah, then you are responsible. And there are many trees there that don't have leaves. Nobody will go there. But for you to attract me in deception and then to have no substance or real value is not something that Jesus Christ lives. And it says, look, a day is coming when there will be judgment. And I'm showing you a sample here. Ladies and gentlemen, God's love also has within it judgment. And that is recognizing that I need to be able to come to God as I am. And know that because of his grace and his mercy, I don't need to pretend. Amen. I don't need to be hypocritical as well. You know, we do some very funny things as believers. We make other people believe spiritual. Yes. That's the way people are men of God. It's different. It's a higher standard. It's one standard though. I wrote one article recently. I said I'm a, I'm a hypocrite. I don't want to be, but if you look at me and you feel, ah, I never want there to be more about me than it is really about me. Do you understand? I don't ever want to have a facade that looks beautiful where what is inside is dirty. I would rather look dirty and be beautiful inside. And he's saying, let's stop trying to keep up with appearances. The business world today wants to keep up with appearances. You want to look like everything is going well, even when nothing is going well. You want to look like, I'm, ah, me and God were cool. God was just speaking to me yesterday. I stopped talking to you. That message I'm preaching, you heard it from somebody. Just polished it, and I added some few words to it. God wants us to be able to, he loves us in a way that says, come to me as you are. Yes, I love you. Yes, I'm gracious, but I'm fiercely just. And a day is coming when people will, people who have it coming, will have it coming. And Jesus Christ expresses it in many ways to the Pharisees. He says, look, if you have it coming, you're going to have it coming. God is merciful, he's gracious, he's also just, he doesn't want us to keep up with appearances. Be real. Be real. One of the biggest things that we are breaking a, a mold from is the fact that, yeah, so we preach on Sundays, we work every day. And if our life is not in harmony, if, it, if our life is different from when we preach, that's our real life. If I'm going to cheat you, if I'm going to con you, if I'm going to do all sorts of things to you in the real world, that's who I really am. And I pray that God grants us grace to look at the lens as well and realize that sometimes we need to be able to love people enough to be able to correct them. To be able to challenge them. And say, ah, no, 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 guy, no. No, no. It's not befitting. It's not right. And only because they are keeping up the appearance to say, this is the standard. Meaning that, if you look at the parable of the prodigal son, the master didn't say, yeah, so what happened to those prostitutes? Every sinner I mean, every, every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. Every saint has a past, every sinner has a future. And Jesus Christ will operate with them understanding that. We appear if we are supposed to be. And that's why Paul will say, I'm writing this to believers, so don't believe us. If you find a brother who is doing this, who is doing this, who is doing that, correct him, challenge him. That's the brother. For the world, grace and mercy. Because grace and mercy is the horizontal dimension. Vertical is, you are not inside. Ah, no. 
The height, the depth of it is judgment, the height of it is truth. And on that layer as well, we need to be able to engage people and let them know what the truth is. I pray that God will not allow anything to stop us from loving as we should in Jesus' name. That none of life's challenges, none of life's realities will mask God's love to us and will make it difficult for us to love others in Jesus' name. 